Dear family and friends in Christ, may you know the rich love of our God and Heavenly Father as He pours it out to you in each and every way in many and various ways with His blessings. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for this life that you have given us. We thank you, O Lord, that you value every life, that as you have created us uniquely and wonderfully, use us to share your love with others in many and various ways that they too may know your love, may know your mercy, may know the grace that comes in the forgiveness of sins through your son's death on the cross. In all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we have set aside time to discuss those issues that are often called life issues. Life issues are things such as abortion or crisis pregnancy. Life issues refer to things like euthanasia or assisted suicide. Life issues refer to handicaps and disabilities and many other things that sometimes raise red flags. Maybe some of those issues raise red flags for you cause you to cringe for just a minute. Maybe you wonder for a moment, should things that are hot button or controversial like those things be discussed in church? I can actually say that on more than one occasion I've been approached to not talk about these life issues in church. But these life issues, if they are strictly political, if they are strictly referring to things that are on the left or right-hand side of the aisle, how we will vote, pro-choice or pro-life, then it's true. They should be thrown out of the church. The controversy and the politics should be thrown out. But if they are issues of heart, matters that affect people deeply in their souls, issues of life and death, issues of the way people live out their faith lives, then we certainly should address these things in church. Because if you look throughout God's Word, God addresses matters of the heart. Whether you look in the Old Testament or the New Testament, God address, addresses matters of the heart. Things that maybe are difficult for us to talk about, but things that are important for us to talk about. Whether you read Paul, Paul's epistles or Jesus' Gospels or the prophets in the Old Testament, you see where God cares about His people and He cares about the matters of their hearts. In the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word that is used often translated as heart. It's the word lab. It's just a real short little word. It shows up all over the place. But that word lab that's translated heart all over the place, it's deeper than that. Because if you read into the meaning, you see that it's talking about the innermost being of people. It's talking about the very mind and heart of people. It's talking about, even at times, the soul of people. Matters of heart get at those things that are deep, deeply rooted in us, affect us deeply. It was interesting because if you go through the Old Testament, you'll see where this word heart is used. And at times, there will be leaping of, joy, leaping of the heart to refer to joy. At times, it will talk about the striking of the heart to refer to grief. At times, it will refer to evil of the heart to refer to guilt. But I'd like to take you back to our reading from Hosea chapter 2 for today. Because in Hosea 2, right at the very beginning there, at the end of verse 14, God says, speak tenderly to her. Now, while you see it in the English that way, it actually uses that word lab, and it says, speak tenderly to her heart. Speak tenderly words of comfort to her heart. And if you know the book of Hosea, you know that Hosea was writing to a people who had been unfaithful. A people who had not been faithful to their betrothed, to their beloved, to the true God. But he was writing to a people who were rebellious and sinful. Who did not have God as the center of their lives, but rather themselves. And he says, speak to their hearts. Speak this message of comfort. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. He wants to turn the striking of the heart, their grief, the evil of their heart, their guilt, into the leaping of their hearts, their joy. As he calls them faithfully his wives, calls us his wife. He knows that they have been unfaithful. They've been rebellious. But he again 
as a husband loves his wife, he loves his people. And isn't that how God's work, how God works? He doesn't give to us what we deserve as rebellious sinners. He doesn't give to us what we should have because we are imperfect. But instead, He gives to us His love and compassion. Instead, as a matter of heart, He gives to us forgiveness of our sins. Unfortunately, like the children of Israel, though, unfortunately like them, we can be rebellious at times as well. We know what God's Word says. We know that He is to be the number one in our lives. But how often do other things take the place of God as number one in our lives? How often is it something, not maybe a Baal as is mentioned in the Old Testament reading, but our comfort, our pleasure, our peace of mind, our money. And what about you? What types of things will at times Replace God as number one in your lives. Jesus said it is not those things that are the problem. It truly comes from our hearts. In Mark 7, he says, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. And even though Jesus gives a quite an extensive list, list there, we know that He's really not done because we know how many things will divide us from God. But then, there's this one more thing that John mentions in his first epistle. Nothing. Nothing. When we fail to do what God has commanded, when our hearts do not pour out His love. John asks this question, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? When we know the goodness of God's Word, the graciousness of His blessings, but do not share it, Is that not also a matter of heart? Now if these questions, if these life issues are strictly political, then we shouldn't talk about them. But if they are matters of the heart deeply affecting the soul, getting at the very faith walk of our sisters and brothers, and we have that healing message of the gospel, are we not sinning when we do not share it? Are we not sinning when we fail to share that good news message of God's forgiveness and His grace? His undeserved grace that He gives to us. If these are merely political issues, we shouldn't talk about them. But let's look at a couple of issues here and decide if they're political or if they are matters of the heart. A 16-year-old girl She makes a mistake, and she gets pregnant. She gets pregnant, and she's scared. She's frightened. She doesn't know what she's going to do. So there's an answer for her. She goes. She has an abortion. But instead of the fear, instead of the the guilt going away, she's still flooded with those concerns, new concerns. Is that a political issue or a matter of heart? This same girl, at first, she thinks that things will be okay. But when the day that her baby was supposed to be born, she gets violently ill, physically ill. She has to leave school. She's so sick. Years pass. Maybe a drink or two will help her out, make her feel a little better. But nothing will cure the pain for long. She's a Christian woman. She knows the Lord and she knows His forgiveness. But so often, instead of hearing forgiveness, she hears people talking about those kind of women, those kind of girls. And she wonders, is God's love great enough to forgive her? 
Is that a political issue or a matter of heart? Uh, yeah, it's a young man. At first, he, he looks at this as an awful thing, as a circumstance that needs to be dealt with. Here he's getting ready to go off to college. He's got so much of his future ahead of him. And he's gotten his girlfriend pregnant. Well, there's a solution. Pay for an abortion, but the Spirit convicts his heart. And he realizes that's a child. He realizes that he wants nothing more than to protect this young woman, to protect his child, to be there for them. He calls... And she says, it's done. Instead of feeling relief, though, he feels guilt. And he weeps bitterly. Is that a political issue or a matter of heart? 3,000, nearly 3,000 children a day are brutally put to death. Children who God intended to be unique and wonderful, to serve Him, to love Him, to be in relationship with Him in this world. Are they a political issue or a matter of heart? Or what about the husband and wife who have been married for 53 years? She has a stroke. It's a severe stroke. And... She can still eat. Her speech is a little bit of slurred. But she can't. She's bound her wheelchair because half her body is numb. It can't. If she can't feel it. it can't. Her husband looks at her and he cares for her. He looks after her. But he knows this is not the life that she wanted. The state that they live in is a state that allows euthanasia or assisted suicide. He reasons in his own mind. Well, we're Christian. Wouldn't this be better for her to send her to be with the Lord? Is this a political issue? Or a matter of heart? Folks, these, these aren't just political issues. This isn't just a question of whether you vote Republican, Democrat, or Libertarian, or whatever party. This isn't being called pro-choice or pro-life. This is about looking at each life as valuable because it is valuable to God. That each life matters because it matters to God. The discussion we have here in our church is not to inform your political decisions, but it is to look at God's Word and the way it is meant to inform us. The reason that we care about life, a child that is two years old, to a, a mother who's 97 years old, to a to a person who's bound to a wheelchair and can't seem to do much. The reason we value each of those lives is because God does. Because God created each of those lives uniquely and wonderfully. He created each of those lives to be His children. He created each of those lives to be in relationship with Him and to know His love and mercy. And He created us to proclaim that love and mercy to proclaim that value that God has for every life. To speak to those who have made mistakes in their lives and tell them that God's forgiveness, that there is nothing that is greater than God's forgiveness. There is no sin that He cannot forgive to the teenager who made that choice, who's grown into the woman who struggles with that choice. We, have been give, we are God's instruments to proclaim that God forgives her. God forgives him. For the, the woman who struggles with post-abortion syndrome, the depression that comes, God has sent us to tell her there is good news. God's grace is unlimited. For those of us who have been judgmental, who have stood and said that only certain girls, those type of women are the ones who do such things, that there is forgiveness for us as well. Forgiveness to know that God's grace, that God's grace was given us instead of His judgment because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because Jesus took our punishment. 
Because Jesus took God's judgment, we receive God's grace. We receive God's mercy and His forgiveness. And we have been given opportunity to speak to these matters of the heart. To take these matters of the heart seriously and to address them not as political issues, but as the people of God who care for one another. For even those who are different and those who maybe they've made mistakes to proclaim to them the Gospel that it is finished on the cross. It is past tense, isn't it? The payment was made in full. There are times where you will not feel forgiven, where you'll struggle with that forgiveness, but that's why we turn to the truth of God's Word that says that it is not us, but it is God. So even when we don't feel it, God's forgiveness is still there for each and every one of us. Because that is what the Gospel does. It speaks to us hope. It speaks to us comfort in the lives that we lead. It speaks to us the reassuring, reassuring promise that God's love will not fail. That it is a matter of His heart and that He cares for each of us more than we can imagine. And so, so we have been called to speak tenderly. To speak to the hearts. To speak to the hearts of those who have made those choices. To speak to the hearts of those who are in the midst of, of, of abortion clinics or abortion performing places. Showing them that each life is a life. A life that God created. But it starts with looking in God's Word and seeing His great value for every life. And then proclaiming that Word. God's love. His forgiveness. Whether it's in Word or sometimes in deeds. Sometimes it will mean visiting someone who's in the hospital. Sometimes maybe it will mean visiting someone who's homebound. Sometimes it will mean offering a word of comfort and strength. Sometimes it will mean pulling someone aside and, and praying with them. When we realize that these are more than political issues, but truly matters of the heart, matter, things that matter to God, then we will look forward to those opportunities to speak to the hearts, to speak hope that we have received, that your sins are forgiven, and that God prepares a place to rest with Him forever. I hope that you do see these as matters of the heart. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we pray that in all matters of our hearts that we would come to you. That in these life issues that they often touch us in ways that we will not realize. That years and years later that these issues will affect us whether we are the ones involved or whether we're family or friends. Lord, we pray your comfort and your peace knowing that we are your beloved. That we are yours who have been forgiven and that we are yours who have been given the gift of your, of your gospel. Help us each day to know your forgiveness. Help us each day to know your grace. And help us not only to know that forgiveness and grace, but to speak it, to share it with others, to proclaim it, so that others too will know that there is nothing, nothing that is too great for you to forgive. There is no sin that you will not forgive. That there is nothing that, you're, that is greater than your love. Help us to know your love. Your tender mercies. Help us to know your promise that one day we shall enjoy new life with more better bodies in your holy presence. Until that day, lead us to speak to the hearts your hope and your grace. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.